A long time ago, when sweet fruit was still hard to find, man decided to create a fruit orchard that would yield him a rich harvest and feed his animals too. A place filled with life all year round. Devised by man, taken over by nature, a secret paradise was created. To this day, it's a place where people, plants and animals live interdependently, cheek by jowl. Day in, day out, year after year. A world of its own, turning with the seasons. Like a carousel, with no beginning, and no end. It all began with an apple, even the story of the orchard. This luscious, sweet fruit is tempting in all its forms, so man began to grow it, cultivate it, and help it proliferate. Over time, a rich biotope was created in the heart of Europe for animals, plants, and humans. According to tradition, the entire family joins in for the harvest. It takes weeks for the fruit to be picked, sorted, and processed. and the orchard's long-term inhabitants dig into what's left over. For field mice, ripe apples are a valuable addition to their usual diet of grasses and seeds. From time to time, grazing sheep wander into the field around the trees. The scent of apples is tempting for them too, but they can only eat fruit that's already been bitten into their mouths don't open wide enough to fit in a whole apple. Down the centuries, since traditional orchards were first planted, man has cultivated thousands of different types of fruit by careful grafting. Harvests are not always this plentiful. But this year, the carousel of life chose to smile on both man and animal. Apples aren't really on the hedgehog's menu, but when they're ripe and sweet, he'll also try a bit. He'd actually prefer to be hunting worms and insects. Inquisitive sheep don't disturb him while he's foraging. After all, who's the one with the prickly spines? Man has been growing fruit since the Middle Ages. Farmers would choose slopes and less fertile ground around their villages to plant the trees. In many places, huge forests of orchards were created, such as here in southern Germany. But such big orchards are rare today. 
These groves with their variety of fruit, with old and young trees and species-rich meadows are no longer really economically viable. Often the fruit is not even harvested, it's simply left on the ground. But that suits the wild animals as the barren season is just around the corner. The windfall fruit slowly decomposes as it returns to nature in the form of minerals, all part of the great cycle of life. The rotting process releases heat, making the apples glow under thermal imaging. Mice seem to enjoy the fermenting fruit. Their body temperature of 37 degrees centigrade makes them glow more brightly than the decomposing apples. Heavy, sweet scents attract butterflies and other insects. The admiral fortifies himself with the fermented juice. A migrant butterfly, he flies hundreds of kilometers south in autumn. When the admiral sets off, the next round in the dance of the seasons begins in the orchard. With harvest time over, the days start to get shorter and the sun loses its strength. When the morning mists lift, the orchard is revealed in a new guise. Now it is rich in color. From the glowing orange of the cherry tree leaves to the red and yellow foliage of the pear, the brightly colored trees are typical of the wonderful diversity of this very special habitat, one that deserves to be protected and preserved. After the first hard frost, the leaves lose their hold on the trees. Winter is approaching. Now is the time to stockpile, and the nuthatch is a master of the art. He studs an entire tree with seeds, grains, and small chunks of nuts. These old trees with their furrowed bark offer plenty of good hiding places. And to make sure that others can't steal his stores, each storage place is carefully sealed. Red squirrels are famous for their partiality to nuts, but hazelnuts are slippery little devils. Nothing in the orchard goes to waste. Although some birds might try to bite off more than they can chew. Just a tiny crack would be enough to get it open. But no, this one's too hard.
Unlike squirrels and nuthatches, the green woodpecker makes no such provision for winter. Year-round, it feeds almost exclusively off ants. Walnuts are ideal for winter stores, but first, the remains of the old shell must be removed. Only clean nuts are stored. They don't rot as quickly and can keep till spring. The squirrel's favorite delicacy grows in almost every mixed orchard. Walnut trees are robust and undemanding. All that effort works up an appetite and fortification is urgently needed from time to time. Walnuts consist of two thirds fat, which quickly stills hunger. And as usual, the leftovers always find takers. Autumn comes to a close amid frost and cold. Stinging nettles growing in the wilder parts of the field attract tree sparrows. Like most birds that stay in Europe in winter, they switch to a diet consisting almost exclusively of grains and seeds. Once the snow falls, it becomes more difficult for many to find food. But not for the nuthatch. He has taken precautions and now his painstaking stockpiling is paying off. He defends his precious fridge with all his might. After all, this is about nothing less than survival. No one is allowed to get too close to his tree. Only the big woodpecker can chase him away. The traditional orchard is a cultivated landscape, ecologically extremely important and home to many wild creatures. But to get it to produce anything, it must be cared for. The best time to prune fruit trees is in winter when they're barren. It's hard work thinning the treetops. Not many farmers bother anymore. The cut off branches are especially useful when there's little else to eat. Bark and buds contain important nutrients, perfect provisions for roe deer along the way. And the orchard has a lot more to offer in winter. The outermost twigs bear deep frozen food, pears or apples that stayed out of the reach of harvesters. Field fairs are grateful takers when they arrive from the north to winter here.
During the day, the mouse seldom emerges from its snowy hiding spot. It's cold and dangerous outside. But mice aren't safe even under the blanket of snow. With his finely tuned hearing, the fox can still hear them rustling about. But whether he can actually catch them is another story. Some years the winter is long and it can take until March before the sun has enough strength to melt the snow. Now the pathways used by mice under the snow are laid bare. Robbed of cover, mice seek shelter in their extensive underground holes. Mice are grass eaters and the fresh green shoots are very tempting. But beware, the ermine is a ruthless enemy. It likes nothing better than mouse for dinner. And its body is so slender, it can even fit into mouse tunnels. It's still wearing its snow-white winter coat, but signs of its future summer colouring are already showing on its head. With the first warm sunshine, things start to get loud and lively. The orchard is home to a multitude of species of birds. The starling sets up a strident call for a partner. The green woodpecker is the carpenter of the fields. Rotting segments of old trees are ideal for carving out hollows. With every traditional orchard lost, its habitat shrinks. After a successful courtship, the starling now needs a home. But this one is already occupied. The great tit, on the other hand, has already found his. The nuthatch is busily planning its family. And it's home. It needs damp mud, as the nest will need renovating before they can move in. He's chosen an old woodpecker hollow for his hatchery, but the entrance is too big. He narrows it so it fits him perfectly. Almost everyone finds a nesting place in the orchard. That's why it's so popular with cave breeders like the blue tit. The squirrel can still feed off its winter stores, if it can find them, that is. Among the first flowers in the field are the wood anemones. At last, they can provide sustenance for insects. The trees are still bare, but their buds are quickly beginning to swell and open up. Time for the squirrel to get itself some fresh food. Buds are rich in protein and very nourishing.
the great tit has also had enough of his winter diet of grains and can catch insects again. Bees have to have their sting removed first, though. When the cherry blossoms begin to unfold, it's a sure sign that spring has arrived. Whether cherry, mirabelle plum, apples or pears, the abundant blossoms promise a rich harvest. The blue tit isn't interested in nectar. It's after the larvae of the winter moth, a pest that develops in the calyxes of unfolding blossoms. For bees, this is their peak harvest time. There will never be so much pollen and nectar at any one time for the rest of the year. Cultivated by man, these orchards are a veritable paradise for bees. Their contribution is extremely important. Without them, there would be no honey and no fruit. It's while they gather pollen that the blossoms are pollinated, enabling fruit to develop. And only then is there fruit for man to harvest. Every year there are masses of blossoms, sometimes early, sometimes late, sometimes all the fruit blossoms at the same time. It all depends on the weather. The carousel of seasons is never quite the same. The kestrel likes to spend its time in the orchards. After all, they're full of mice. And mice are a kestrel's favorite fare. When this young fox has grown up, it will also hunt mice. With all those enemies waiting to pounce, a takeaway seems the wisest choice. It's safer to enjoy the meal at home. In May, the first collared flycatchers return from their winter quarters in Africa. The late arrivals haven't any time to lose. The male loudly advertises his nesting place and, of course, himself. Once he's attracted one of the rather nondescript females, she immediately begins to build the nest. This late in the season, most of the best nesting spots are already taken. This pair was lucky. Or they might just have evicted the previous tenants. The collared flycatcher has no qualms about that sort of thing. Orchards are the ideal habitat for collared flycatchers. Plenty of nesting places and an abundance of nutritious insects. The meadows are extensively used and often grazed by sheep. This results in a particularly wide variety of insects. Airspace above the treetops is hotly contested. Sparrowhawk, common buzzard, kestrel or kite, they all claim the territory for themselves. and the belligerent crows are constantly at war with the birds of prey. Predators in the air, a deadly threat on the ground.
the kestrel still manages to make enough juicy catches. Field mice, water voles and other rodents often breed proliferously in spring, providing the dietary basis for countless birds of prey. The rough bark on the older trees is ideal for furry animals who use it to help scratch off their winter coats. Foxes and hares are also frequent visitors. They feel safer here than in the open fields. The fruit tree's luxuriant blossoms only last a few weeks. If the weather is good and the bees industrious enough, fruit will now be starting to develop. Beneath the trees, everything is still blooming. Dandelions and buttercups thrive especially well in fertilized fields. In less fertile areas, there's an even greater diversity of species, but there are few of these so-called rough pastures left. In the middle of the thick forest of grass, ants and aphids coexist in harmonious symbiosis. The aphids feed on the plant juices, which have a high sugar content, but little valuable protein. The excess sugar is excreted in liquid form. Ants love this so-called honeydew. And in exchange, they protect their aphid herd from predators. Ladybirds are the embodiment of a nightmare for an aphid colony. A single ladybird can consume up to 50 aphids a day. That is, unless it's discovered by the ants first and chased away. The black shiny wood ants also feed almost exclusively off the honeydew of their productive aphids. Old rotting fruit trees provide them with an ideal home. The workers chew holes in the wood and build their nests in them. In early summer, the winged sexual insects swarm out of their hole. Their sole purpose is to ensure the propagation of the species. For the great spotted woodpecker, the teeming ants offer an ideal opportunity to fill its stomach without even trying. Its feet are covered in very thick skin. This protects them from the bites of the antagonized insects. Every four years or so, there's an explosion in the cockchafer population. For several weeks, the beetles eat the leaves off deciduous trees before the males start looking to pair with a female. Mating can take several hours and can be an extremely creative business. They fly mainly in May and June, which is perfect for birds with a family to feed. This is precisely when they need the most food. For the young spotted woodpeckers, the fat bugs are just the right size. But for baby nuthatches, the big buzzing insects are too big to cope with. So to turn it into baby food, the nuthatch parent has to give the bug a good pounding. Try 
again. Nope, it still won't fit. A bit more crushing. There we go. Perfect. In the meadows below, there are noises of a different kind. Loud and clear, male grasshoppers announce their readiness to mate. The dense grass in the field is home to many different kinds of grasshopper, so it's not all that easy to find the right partner. The search is dangerous too. Wasp spiders spin their webs between the blades of grass. Their speciality? Grasshoppers. A careless jump can have a fatal ending. This noise heralds danger for the field dwellers. The season's first mowing has begun. The fragrant, fresh fodder is much appreciated by livestock in the stables. After 20 days in the increasingly cramped breeding hollow, the nuthatch brood are eager to leave their dark confinement. Their parents will continue to feed them for a few days outside the nest. A good thing too, as they haven't quite got the knack of climbing about the tree yet. But with a bit of practice, the young nut hatches will soon be able to hunt their own insects and caterpillars. The green woodpecker's diet consists almost exclusively of ants. When the fields are mown, it has a much easier job of finding their nests on the ground. Overhead, the birds of prey are on patrol. He can scold all he likes, but to little avail. He just has to keep a wary eye out as he works, so that nothing can attack him unnoticed from above. He hollowed out his breeding spot in an old cherry tree. Like all chicks, his young are also insatiable. They need a constant supply of ant mush. Breeding season, blossoming, ripening, mowing and harvesting. The rhythm of nature is repeated every year. The trees don't always bear such an abundance of fruit. 
The first to ripen in the mixed traditional orchard are the cherries. They may be sweet and delicious, but harvesting them is no easy task. It takes a lot of time and effort to bring these delicate fruits home. Each individual cherry must be carefully hand-picked. Now the culinary rat race is on. All creatures, especially birds, are just as fond of the sweet tidbits as humans are. Perhaps the woodpecker is serving his young dessert. Cherries are also great favorites with insects. The cherry fruit fly breeds rapidly in summer and can infest whole areas. They have some rather peculiar looking mating rituals. They lay their eggs individually in the ripe cherries. Most years, there's more than enough fruit for everyone on the trees. Even on the ground, there's plenty of windfall fruit for ground dwellers like mice. But, as is so often the case, danger tends to come from above. The cherry fruit fly's eggs develop within a few days into larvae. Inside the fruit, they're well protected and can munch away to their heart's content. The mouse quickly recovers from its scare. The aroma of the cherries is too tempting. It doesn't mind the maggots inside the fruit. On the contrary, a cherry fruit fly larva would be a welcome addition to its menu. With all the competition about, humans have to harvest the cherries quite quickly. Working in the tall trees isn't just tiring, it's also dangerous, a high risk that not many are prepared to take anymore. Summer inexorably approaches its zenith. Some years it makes quite a dramatic appearance. When it's hot and the damp air rises in the afternoons, towering clouds form in the skies. They presage fierce summer storms, complete with wind and rain. Often, the storms unleash their massive forces overnight. In the morning, the storm has usually blown over and the sun dries up the last few dewdrops.
by noon, it's oppressively hot again. Instead of looking for nectar, the bees seek out the remaining puddles increasingly often. Here they quench their thirst and collect water for the brood. They also use the water to moisten their hives. If temperatures inside the hive are too high, the female workers fan their wings to create a cooling breeze. This evaporates the moisture, which also has a cooling effect. Air conditioning, the Apian way. Along the edges of the field in damp spots, the purple loose strife blossoms in high summer. For butterflies such as the red admiral and the meadow brown, it's an important source of nectar as are the white flowers of the yarrow that have now become popular with many insects. The swallowtail is undoubtedly one of the most beautiful of all butterflies. It feasts on its favorite red clover blossoms. Now all the grasses are in bloom, with many species ripening almost simultaneously. The meadows offer a wide variety of nutritious food for herbivores too. The high grass is also a good hiding place for the doe and her fawn. They feel safe here for the night. At sunrise, the orchard world changes. The high grass will not be safe for long. Farmers are harvesting the ripe grass. It will make especially nourishing hay for their livestock. This is why they wait until later in the summer to mow. Just before the mowing begins, hunters and sometimes also farmers walk through the fields to chase away the roe deer and their young. but they're not always successful. This doe's fawn didn't make it. the crows are already gathering to eat their fill. But the doe refuses to give up. She defends her dead fawn for hours, chasing away anything that dares come near it.
The cadaver would make a welcome meal for the kite too. But as long as the doe mother stands sentry, it will have to wait. Walnut trees generally grow at the edge of the field, as not much can grow in their shadow. They're very popular with squirrels. And woe betide anyone who tries to interfere, they get a good scolding, as only a squirrel can give. Next to squirrels, woodpeckers are the only ones who can open the fruit while it's still green. Tits and other birds reap the benefits. They just carry on drilling the holes made by the woodpecker. And so even they can enjoy the juicy flesh of the unripe nuts. With the grass mowed, the fox has an easier job of hunting for his prey. The haystacks offer mice good cover, but the fox can smell them and hear them. And he can dig. Which means that success is just around the corner. In all the orchards, it's hay harvest time. In warm summer weather, the nourishing grass dries well. The winter supplies for the horses and cattle are secured. Even though the grass has been cut, sheep have their own ways of finding food. Getting to the pears on the trees takes teamwork, though. In the late summer, the orchard really comes into its own and shows why it was planted in the first place. Plums, Mirabelle plums, and pears ripen in concert. Bees find hardly any blossom nectar now. They must meet their energy needs with ripe fruit. Only if the fruit's sugar content is over 50% is it suitable for bees' nutritional purposes. The Williams Crisp pear is much in demand as it's very sweet and aromatic. It's not only a delicacy for human beings. The windfall fruit so beloved of the bees enriches the diet of all the orchard dwellers every year because there's always some fruit left over on the bigger trees after the harvest. And so, we come full circle.
a long time ago, when sweet fruit was still hard to find, man decided to create a fruit orchard that would yield him a rich harvest. A place filled with life all year round. Devised by man, taken over by nature. A world of its own, turning with the seasons. And the carousel of life keeps on turning. <laughs>